Hello friends, I'm Mike Guineri. Welcome to A Skeptic's Journey. Today we have a special guest, Parak Donahue. Parak is an Irish language teacher. He's a native of the Connemara Galtacht and a native Irish speaker. Um, welcome, Parak. Oh, thanks for having me, Mike. Anytime, no problem. Before we get started, I do just want to give a disclaimer out. Um, I've known Park for about three and a half years. He's been my Irish teacher. Um, so there is a pre-existing relationship. He gives great Irish lessons online. Doesn't matter where in the world you are. They're customized. Um, you can learn what you want to learn, how you want to learn it. And they're just fantastic lessons. I'll have a link to his website and his Facebook at the end of this video, as well as down below in the description. Um, so without further ado, uh, fault the park. Oh, got to meet him ahead, Avichel. Nice to be here. So, um, as I mentioned in the intro a second ago, um, you were born and raised uh, on the Galtacht in Connemara, um, and I'm sure a lot of our audience doesn't know what a Galtacht is. Can you uh, give a little description? That's right, Mike. Um, yeah, I grew up on the Galtacht uh, in Connemara, and. Um, Irish is predominantly spoken there. Um, Irish was spoken in Ireland uh, um, before the Norman Saxons came over um, to Ireland, um, and that's a long time ago. Um, uh, so now we have English and Ir Irish uh, in, in, in era. Era is Ireland uh, in Irish. Um, and uh, but but uh, after after uh, the invasion, <laughs> I like to call it, um, most of uh, the Irish speakers were pushed to the fringes. Um, uh, so, and you see most of these Irish Gaeltachts uh, are uh, over on the coastlines. Uh, for, for example, in Kerry, uh, there was a small Gaeltacht link there, Connemara, Mayo, working your way up to Donegal, and um, in the southeast part of Ireland too, in Waterford, um, but Irish was uh, mainly spoken uh, uh, in Ireland. Um, uh, it is the first, lang first language uh, for the people as well, uh, and currently uh, English as well. Um, we also have other people living in Ireland too. Uh, uh, I, I remember seeing a statistic uh, for, um, uh, I think there was a quarter of a million Poles uh, uh, who immigrated to Ireland. So Polish is also another, another language that's being spoken in Ireland. Uh, when Park was talking about the Galtacht being on the coast, um, he's from the Connemara Galtacht, which is uh, near Galway, for frame of reference for anybody who's yeah. unfamiliar with the location. That's right. So it's like for, uh, where it's eh, 40 minutes uh, to Galway City from where I live. Um, usually uh, the village is uh, uh, situated between Carrow and uh, and Spittle. Um, uh, I, I like to call it. Uh, Rosseville uh, is the uh, uh, well, where I grew up, um, and well, that's where my uh, my family has always lived. Um, um, my my grand my my grandmother was born there. My grandfather as well. And so, as far as you know, your family's been there as, as far back as anybody knows. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, we our family hasn't done any genealogy, but. We've, uh, from what I understand, uh, our family has always spoken Irish, uh, and Irish was always spoken uh, in the household uh, as well. Um, I was quite blessed to grow up with uh, uh, with my grandparents uh, in the same household, and uh, English was only spoken if family came over from the UK or from the US. So, if, if someone like me or one of my listeners were to uh, visit a Galtak or your Galtak, um, people would be able to speak to us in English, no problem, is that right? Yes, yes, no problem okay. at all, yeah. Now that's more, uh, yeah, you know, in the last, uh, you know, 30 years, uh, I say, but uh, yeah, most people are able to speak English, but there was times when uh, it was all Irish and some people didn't speak English. Um, so, but uh, currently now, yeah, you'd have no problems uh, um, speaking English uh, uh, to people in there. But it'd be, it'd be, it would be great if you did have Irish. Because uh, that was my next question, you know. Um, I find the Irish people when visiting to be extremely patient and tolerant. But if I were to go in there with my uh, very limited and, and, and learn and learning process Irish, would they beat me about my head? Or would they you know, uh, be well, okay I, understanding <laughs> that I'm just trying to get it? Yeah, well, I think 
Um, well, patience is a virtue, and uh, obviously, people. Uh, I, 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 from my understanding, when you do visit other cultures, where um, if they can speak English, they would rather speak to you in English because it's easier, you know. Right. Um, um, but yeah, people are happy to hear you. If you have some Irish, yes, uh, or if you can converse in Irish, obviously, the locals uh, uh, really appreciate it, and uh, it's a it's a whole different world. Uh, I'm speaking from the Connemara Gael, but. Uh, uh, to it's a you're you're going into a different culture, uh, and and the people that live there because uh, uh, it's a living language, so you can experience uh, uh, that way of life. Um, uh, hmm. That was kind of one of my next questions. Was you know, how do you think it is living on a Galtok compared to living off of it, or growing up on one as opposed to off? Well, that's a, gr a great question. Because um, I currently live in Canada now, um, and I've been living overseas for a while. But like I said in the beginning, um, I was very blessed to have a uh, to have a really good uh, upbringing in 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 the girl part. Um and and uh, living there was a wonderful experience because I also growing up with my grandparents, it was it was a, it was a really uh, entering their world. Like, uh, and especially when people came to the house, the neighbors, friends, uh, obviously family, um, and hearing all the stories and uh, all the laughing. Um, something I love about Connemara, especially in the Gelt, that uh, the people that live there, they love to, uh, to laugh and joke and uh, smile. And uh, even though the weather is quite depressing sometimes uh, during the winter time, <laughs> it can be pretty gray. Anybody out um, there who wants to visit Ireland, go in the summer. Trust me, <laughs> that's when I go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but you don't go to Ireland for the weather, uh, Mike. You no. go there. Yeah, you go there for the it experience. It helps, though. It does help. And I, I was over there uh, last September, and the weather was phenomenal. We had a wonderful t uh, three weeks. Uh, um, and and uh, when the weather is sunny and warm it's 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 a beautiful country to visit uh, because it's so rich in um, culture tradition music um it, 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 you'll never it, you'll never see ireland in one trip oh of course no definitely not i've been there about a month in total and i've barely scratched the surface Yes, and I, I, I'm from there, and I've seen a lot of uh, the countryside, and I'm still learning something about that little country uh, all the time. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, looking at history, you know, in the last hundred years, uh, you know, if you look at history, you know, within a, a thousand years, and, and then you go back to, you know, Neolithic times, um, it just fascinates me, like, for a little country. There was a lot happening there. And for me... Um, uh, there's a uh, historian by the name of Barry Conlof um, who talks about the, you know, yep. Celtic languages. Um, I know you're aware of him, uh, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, he mentions that um, he believes Irish was already spoken, uh, or th this language was being spoken already uh, on the western um, uh, part of Europe, um, Spain, uh, uh, Wales, Ireland. Um, parts of France as well. So for an Irish person, uh, or as a Gael, I like to see myself. Um, that Gael is an appreciation for you know everything uh, that I love about uh, uh, my culture. Mm -hmm. uh, extremely proud of it, uh, and I embrace it because I teach the Irish language. I've been teaching it for a while, and I try and instill that into my students, uh, right. especially if their ancestors came from there. Um, uh, a lot of people left. Uh, during uh, the famine and uh, even up to 2008 uh, people were leaving Ireland in their droves um, and even in my own community a lot of people left um, uh, and but that doesn't mean that they uh, that they have forgotten where they come from right uh, it just means that they had to leave and look after their you know uh, if they had a family or start a family elsewhere um, they still love where they come from and love the people and people have moved back to i know lots of people have moved back to back to ireland and 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 you, you also can have a good life there too uh, 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 as well yeah i mean when people left like you said during the famine and whatnot families were broken up I, like i know in my family you know the parents just put the kids 
as they saved money on a cart and sent them off to the ship and, you know, never saw them again. Yeah, it was awful uh, what happened uh, with the famine. Um, and, uh, I mean, um, it was something that happened and uh, it, uh, it's something that traumatized uh, uh, the people as well. And uh, we have been uh, uh, trying to overcome that trauma for a long time. And I, I try and be uh, optimistic and positive about it because now I, I, I say to people who are interested in getting to know their, you know, or getting to know their, uh, where they come from, especially uh, people, who, um, Irish people um, uh, who are living overseas or in Ireland to embrace their identity. Uh, and that's and the positive aspects of it. There's lots of uh, uh, positive aspects um, that I like about, uh, you know, when you embrace the language uh, and the culture and the music. Um, it's very important uh, for yourself to know uh, where you come from. Get gr it's very important to get grounded in that. Absolutely. Yeah, especially when you feel, um, especially this day and age, I see people, especially with the pandemic as well, um, you know, I, I, when I started during, I was teaching all through the pandemic, and I had people in Ireland and all over, uh, over the world learning the Irish night. But, um, you know, something that comes up all the time too is like finding meaning in your life, and meaning to me too is uh, embracing uh, these wonderful, um, these wonderful traditions we have. Uh, that, uh, uh, as a culture, as an uh, as an Irish person or as a Gael, I like to say. Um, that goes hand in hand with uh, learning the language um, because that's also adds another dimension to your to your to your experience as a person here uh, right. especially people who live overseas like North Americans like uh, how many Irish people uh, immigrated to uh, to the US it's over a it's million a, I think right yeah it was a lot and you got, you got a whole bunch to Australia and some to um, South America yeah, prisoners to Australia. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's like... I guess uh, there are worse places you could be sent, but... <laughs> I, I agree, I agree, I agree. Uh, but there was also Irish that went to uh, the plantations in the Caribbean as well. Yeah, and yeah they were, basically as slaves. Yeah, indentured, and they never really got what they were promised. So, uh, uh, so yeah. And the Irish, uh, they're, they're, they're hard workers um, too, so... Um, uh, uh, they built New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, all those people who came over, the people here didn't want to do those jobs digging ditches and canals and whatever else. And so they left for the Irish to do. Yeah. I heard the same thing with uh, Chicago as well. A lot of people in Connemara and Chicago and Boston, and they worked they worked hard. Yep, um, definitely. But, uh, but not afraid to work. Um, and I have that work ethic myself too. I, 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 I take this... Uh, uh, very seriously too uh, my teaching and I've, like you said you've been with me for a while and uh, <laughs> but I, I, I can't get rid of some of my students they just love the conversational Irish aspect too because that's what I focus on conversational Irish even though I have had three students start uh, last week and um, right away they're, they're uh, get them talking um, because um, for me uh, I always hear you know I learned Irish through school but I can't speak it and um, I'm thinking to myself okay there's something wrong with that uh, equation. Uh, how is it that some of my students can start speaking, you know, Irish uh, very quickly? And I'm not saying it's an easy language. It takes a while, um, and depending on and people's schedules too. Like uh, I, I remember uh, with you too, your schedule was like extremely busy, but you found 45 minutes. Uh, sometimes 45 minutes was like uh, like to a, a lot time for that. Some people only have 45 minutes in their in their schedule, but they make an effort. Right. That's where you have to start. You have to start somewhere. You can't talk. You can talk about learning a language or doing anything, but you got to get get into the thick of it. And some people, uh, six six months, they are some people a few years. It, it depends. And I always find if they if they make an effort to go back to Connemara and you know. Uh, speak the language there, uh, get immersed, you know, uh, a, a little bit. Um, obviously, the ideal uh, situation would be if you're living there in the community and you're speaking right. Irish. Um, that would be the ideal situation for anyone. Not everyone has that, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, you know, that um, time to, you know, uh, to do that. So they, you know, uh, that's why I created the online uh, lessons and. And the lessons have been so far very positive. Um, 
And yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, Park, you had mentioned a bunch of times about the uh, teaching culture along with the Irish language. And, you know, it makes perfect sense to me having done it with you. Um, there are just some things in a language that don't mean as much and you don't get if you don't truly understand where it comes from and what it relates to. Um, that's a very important thing. So I'm curious, too. Um, as you we've discussed, I have been uh, on a quest to research to see if any old ways, practices, whatever may, may it be, um, going back to the Celts before the Celts, ancient times, somewhere steeped in the history of Ireland, if there was any ways and practices that might provide some sort of relief to mental health challenges, such as anxiety and depression. Um, and I just, I think there's something there. Um, mm -hmm. I think definitely with regards to balance, mm -hmm. I felt like these um, ancient Irish as a general catchphrase, mm -hmm. balance was important to them. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find those things that they did that, you know, might have grounded them more. Um, and we've had a little conversation about this in the past, but I was just wondering if you could, uh, if there's anything done in Ireland in general, or it's done on the Galtok that yeah. um, you think might be, you know, beneficial to me uh, mental health that's coming from years ago. Well, it's 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 really, uh, I mean, first thing is uh, uh, don't take life too seriously. Uh, uh, that's a and and have a few laughs. Um, and uh, as a, when I was growing up, uh, uh, you know, during my teenage years, especially because uh, those years were, I remember, you know, a tradition that we had was going, when we used, my father and I uh, used to wake me up in the morning park, it's time to go to the bog. And a young teenager, Saturday morning, that was the last thing I wanted to do, uh, Mike, uh, <laughs> get up. Uh, so anyways, I got up, uh, my brother uh, uh, as well, um, moaning and complaining. Um, but um, yeah, so we, we it was like maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, in the car, maybe sometimes longer. Um, and even uh, if I was able to get my dad to, uh, you know, switch uh, uh, seats and I get in the steering wheel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did that too. Great practice to learn how to drive the car. Uh, so we did that. That's the worst yeah. thing that happened. You end up in a bog. I know. <laughs> It'll be yeah. preserved. It would be, yeah. So anyways, you get out to the bog and uh, we would have, um, we, we'd, you know, start uh, cutting peat. Um, there's a process involved with that too. Um, uh, and uh, so obviously, you know, you need the weather, depending on the weather. Um, right. It's amazing. We did get days in between that were dry to to work and even dry the peat during the summertime, and we used to bring home truckloads of it to to water, to heat the house. And that was the only form of heating we had in our house. We had a uh, an open fireplace and a range, and uh, my mom, you know, slaved away at making sure there was uh, uh, turf there to to heat the boiler in the in the in the side press, as she used to call it. And she used to even have like towels and stuff like that to warm. We had no rads or anything like that. Right. And, well, yeah. fortunately, it doesn't get too, too cold in the winter in Ireland because of the jet stream. No, it's not too cold, but our house was, you know, it was an old cottage. Uh, so, it, it, but the, it, it was warm. Yeah, we, uh, the, so the center place was the sitting room. Um, so, you know, moving, so I'll go back to the bog too, because that's one of the traditions I want to talk about is, uh, so it, it was like a community out there too, because we had, um, people working on the bog too, uh, other people, neighbors, mm -hmm. and people from other parts of uh, the the Gaeltacht area. And uh, the, well, all, all I remember, uh, we used to get we make a fire, uh, and we you know bring lunch uh, um, out with us, all of us, and and then after we finish, let's say around noon or something, we'd all get together and make a make a fire and uh, you know put uh, bog tea get water great uh, it's got an interesting taste to it mm. um and um sit around there and we just talk and um and we talk about uh, uh the, the days that were gone and what's going on in the world right now and i as a teenager was sitting there too and we'd and, and then we'd have we'd be joking around with each other and it was wonderful and i thought that's a, a great example of you know people uh, just having a uh, working and then taking a break, talking to each other, joking with each other, um, 
and uh, that that was really important. Do you think uh, that's still done now, or do you think everybody's face there is buried in a screen, just like here in the U.S.? Well, no, I you know people are still cutting teeth, even though they want to ban that. But, uh, but I feel that that's a tradition, um, right. the, especially the with the, you're cutting it by hand. Um, that's a that's an important tradition, and people still want to cut peat and have that form of heat. Um, yeah, there's still people, uh, so th there are still people doing that. Um, and uh, our family stopped cutting peat, but my dad uh, he cut so much he cut so much peat. Uh, I mean, it's such physically uh, labor intensive work. Uh, I used to remember seeing blisters on his back when he was out there working. Sometimes that's sometimes we do get we did get hot days. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 yeah. So, um, so it's, but that's a tradition. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, what's like, you know, here in North America or in the West at the moment where people have, you know, like the mental health is really high. Uh, right. It's interesting though, that that's a tradition. And that, and I wonder if that's, you know, derived off of, from what I understand, you know, back in ancient and Celtic times that people would go to the bogs, the same idea as kind of a communal thing. Um, but they went to put sacrifices in it, be a human or animal, or to put valuables in it as offerings to the uh, the gods of the the ground gods, I guess, the, the yeah. tonic gods. Um, and even some thought it was actually the bogs were a gateway from their world to the world of the gods below. Um, so that, that could very well be a tradition that carried through and. Perhaps that gave them peace too. It gave them a little mental health, you know, knowing that you know they're making a sacrifice of whatever type and think they're appeasing their whatever gods they worshipped and, um, you know, doing the right thing. Um, and while they were there, they were gathering. It was probably almost, you know, I'm wondering if it was like a semi-religious type of thing, like like going to church, go to the bog. Yeah, it was because I remember um, when I had my uh, in-laws, uh, we went out to visit the bog. They never seen a bog uh, uh, because they were, they're both passed away now. Um, but they did get to Ireland and they did get back to the Gaeltacht and I brought them out to the bog. And when we were leaving the bog, um, we used to leave our teapots and, and pots uh, like in a hole in the bog. And um, uh, I remember um, saying to my uh, father-in-law, do you want to put a loonie? That's the Canadian dollar, it's a coin. I right. put a loony in one of the teapots. So that was an offering mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, uh, to the, like you said, to the to the gods of the bog. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that really stands out for me. And I, obviously, so Connemara was very so. Uh, people were sociable, uh, you know, going to the pub too, and that's a very that was a very sociable thing too. Um, uh, uh, so uh, Irish people are very sociable, um, and. Um, that's they have no problem they have great wonderful personality and that's the other thing you have to have personality also if you're learning languages too the like personality is key you right. know you can't and you have to have that com confidence too and, uh, and irish people and ge uh, in general that, that they're very good at it uh, they can speak to anyone um and um and it's and and and, and, and also uh, tell a story um that's another great tradition like uh, oh yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah, the Bardic tradition, mm -hmm. one of the Bardic tradition. And there were so many of them back in Connemara, like some of the elderly people, like they were fantastic storytellers. So I just remember sitting in the sitting room listening to um, specifically one man uh, by the name of John, uh, John Shoga. Um, he was a fantastic storyteller. Um, he'd make you laugh and cry at the same time uh, and make you afraid too. Uh, the whole... Yeah, but the stories are preserved in this. The, oh yeah, the definitely. Time. Yeah, I hope. Uh, yeah, and that's the other thing. Like your imagination, uh, it's like uh, that's something else I, I love about Ireland too. Um, like your imagination starts to just this wonderful, um, wonderful uh, ideas come to you when you're in that country, um, and uh, there hasn't been anyone that I have met that has not liked uh, going to Ireland, and if they do. Uh, it must have been a very terrible uh, uh, pint of Guinness they had in a pub. <laughs> yeah, they stayed in Dublin the whole time. <laughs> yeah, and that's the other thing. Ireland is not Dublin. Uh, 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 rural Ireland, outside of uh, that area, that that's the uh, that's the other. There's two Irelands. I always say that to my students. There's two Irelands, and so and then the, and then when you go to the Gaeltacht, that's another uh, that's another area as well that you have to explore uh, because it's uh, it's a. Uh, uh, now things have changed a lot too because uh, you know uh, 
Ireland has progressed into a, a different. It's a different. It's 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 different because the technology has also influenced the right. country, country too, and then you have all the big corporations there too. So that has uh, influenced the Irish psyche too. But I I feel that Irish people. It, it doesn't matter. Technology is not going to fill fill that void because you still you still need uh, meaning in your life. Uh, and I find the only way to do that is to do it through, you know, exploring uh, your culture and, and, and loving where you come from too. Right. Uh, like loving the things that we are, you know, the music, uh, the music and the language is interconnected because we also have Shano singing too. Some wonderful Shano singing in, in Connemara and all over Ireland too. Uh, and that's a great tradition uh, uh, as well, Mike. And you had mentioned two things that stood out to me. Um, one is a storytelling tradition, and I could definitely see that linking back um, to long ago because at times things were communicated mainly orally. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, is a deep tradition, I would think, among way back. And you know, if it makes people happy and puts them in a good mood and um, provides some balance and some grounding, so they know who they are and where they came from, um, I could see that being beneficial for mental health. Um, also, you mentioned the sociability of the people, and I hadn't thought of it until now, but, you know, that kind of makes sense, too, because let's take the Celts, for example. I mean, within their tribes, it was, there were the people of the tribe were almost one. They weren't individual people. They had to work together to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, even the laws we spoke about in the past, the Brayon laws, mm-hmm. differently, a completely different justice system. Um but that revolved more around um, self-policing, self-discipline, um, respect, responsibility, and, and, you know. Yeah. So it's a different world. Yeah. And uh, I remember my grandmother, like, uh, you know, she had uh, a lot of children. Um, and uh, and uh, she also took care of other uh, family members' children, too. Uh, and uh, imagine that a huge families, like a huge Catholic families, and also taking care of other fam- of families, children's uh, as well. Because maybe you know, back in the day, you know, you never know what was going on for families back in the day. But God, you know, but also, uh, you know, they might spend a week or two down at the house, uh, some uh, you know, uh, cousins or whatever. So uh, something that stood out for me uh, uh, in our household is uh, how in the. Uh, uh, my my father remembers, you know, killing uh, uh, sheep uh, for food. Uh, very independent that way, like growing food as well. Um, right. All of that, like everything, uh, but also very um, um, generous too. I was hearing that too. My grandfather was uh, really uh, very very respected in the in the community, um, and. Uh, but I also heard people that my dad, you know, people, uh, some households that didn't have food all the time. You know, that, I, I, it was hard to believe. This was uh, not too, this is like uh, in the ni- early 1940s, 50s. Uh, right. Just hearing stuff like that really disturbed me. Like I thought we were over the famine. I mean, and I was hearing some people struggle with food. That was very disturbing for me to hear that. But um, to hear that our our house was always like we we, we always had food, um, you know, no one went went without. I thought that was pretty incredible, uh, you know, that independence and and my grandfather was very um, uh, a big man. He had a big presence and right. uh, and he had a good his wife, uh, his, my grandmother too. She was a good woman too. So they together they were a good team, and I think that's what it comes down to, you know. Um, if you're in a relationship that, like that, um, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, to be able to um, go through life, you know, especially as, if, if you're a couple, um, yeah, yeah, you have to, there's, there's going to be good, uh, good days and bad days. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's easier if you do it as a team. And it's even easier if you do it as a community. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So one other thing that, you had mentioned to me quite a while ago, and, and st- it still sticks in my head now. Um, was something I think you, you said your father had told you about balance with nature. And oh, being def- sure to yeah. get outside and yeah, and th- there's a lovely word in Irish like uh, like uh, when we when we see someone and they're just uh, there's this uh, the, the this wonderful aura around them 
we would we would say is thin and not or a he's a, he's a natural person. Mm-hmm. He can't get any more beautiful than that. And specifically, we say that uh, you know thin and not or it's a, it's a lovely uh, phrase. And uh, yeah, natural meaning you know obviously you're in touch with your you know who you are uh, as a person, um, and that's different in every culture. But uh, in Connemara, uh, uh, what I saw, uh, especially during, I think I was very blessed to to witness what I did during the time uh, I had in Ireland because it, there was a transition in the nineties uh, from that uh, right. when we went into the Celtic Tiger, when more money came into Ireland. Now I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It was we needed some, uh, you know, the infrastructure, you know, was pretty. You know, to get to Dublin and Ireland now within two and a half hours, that's incredible. You know, it used to take a lot, a lot longer. So there's right. positives and negatives about all the wealth that is in Ireland. But, now, but you can have all the wealth, but you, you can still be unhappy, you know. Um, right. And you and I know, you know, we've talked about people that have, you know, huge wealth. <laughs> <laughs> we've had this conversation, yes. you know. Yes. yes. You know, it, uh, so... Yeah, wealth is it's important. Um, but how do we define wealth today in you know 2023? Um, uh, and why is there so much more mental health? You know, the other thing is they were eating really um, like they never ate anything out of a box. I remember talking to my my aunt who's passed away now, but she said, well, "Park, we never ate anything out of a box." It was so food was very you know eating good food, right? Fresh food. Fresh food. Chemicals and preservatives. No and chemical, whatnot. yeah, no chemicals or anything like that. It's just out of the garden. That was know? one of the things I loved in Ireland. You know, you go to a pub or a restaurant, and it wasn't like here in the U.S. where you're given a menu with like 50 choices. It was like three choices, and that was it. But everything was just fresh, just harvested, locally sourced, and mm-hmm. cooked up, and it was great. You know, and you yeah. could always find one of the three things to try. Definitely. And local, uh, uh, like uh, 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 I support, even where I live, I support local farmers and I I just love eating local food and uh, I, I, I try and do the best I can uh, with the people I know in my community and, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of that. And that's, and, and Connemara was, was good for that too. Um, but people were very self-sufficient too. They could, you know, uh, like a fields and plant potatoes and and turnips and and and, and cabbages like a, um, some of these fields now are full of briars I, even my father who but he worked in there my grandfather um, and if something my grandfather used to say when my father was working out there by the year the you know you know God bless your work that's something they always said when someone right. was a give a compliment how many do we ever give compliments today <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to the, the idea of, you know, uh, you sustaining the earth and the earth sustaining you back. Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, and I know there's uh, people that are going back to that. Um, I, uh, there's some lo- local farmers that are growing um, uh, organic vegetables now uh, for, for the community. So something that I witnessed my father doing, like people are now are going back to that, like us and younger people too. Uh, and then uh, teaching these people uh, how to farm um, and, and then going out in the land themselves and be, being able to, you know, uh, grow food. Um, uh, yeah, that's a huge thing. Uh, and that's another thing, if you're eating healthy, uh, that also helps your, you know, your, your constitution. Oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah. Most of us are guilty of not doing that. Though, so. Yeah, yeah, but but that's going back to to your, you know, that, that's a simple thing. Um, but it was something that was that you had to do because they did, they had to, uh, because uh, uh, that, that that's it was in, in, innate in them, uh, Mike, to do to do go out and and work the land, and it's so good to work the land, getting your hands and uh, it's it work uh, physical work is uh, is very good, like. Uh, moving your body is very important and uh, i tell you if you look at some of the hands on my even my father's hands but i, I always love looking my hands are like uh, uh you could say uh, uh woman's hands but uh, <laughs> these these guys their fingers were huge like they're jesus you know they could pick up a, a schlon the the tool they used to cook eat and go out there for eight nine hours or sometime longer and you know work that 
uh, schlong and cook the peat and truckload yeah, that, of it. Yeah, that's that's hard work. Um, yeah, yeah, physical work. For, for yeah. people who don't know, do you want to describe the process of harvesting peat? Yeah, it's uh, well, uh, well, there's uh, it's pretty pretty simple, really. Uh, you, first of all, you have to have a bog, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know that's the first thing. Uh, you won't so find any peat in New York City. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, so you go out and you, first of all, you have to take off the the top part. They call it the scraw, and you take that off, and uh, you you can take uh, depending on the size of the bog, you take as much as you you know you can. And, um, and then you get to the, the, the part that is uh, peat and you cut it with a schlong with a specific tool and you know you you, you, you have to uh, it's labor intensive so you have to bend your back put the schlong into the into the it's kind of like mud like bog like mm -hmm. and then you take a piece out and it's like a rectangle uh, in shape um, is that and, the tool and, that's kind of like a, almost like a saw on one side and like a hook on the other side? Yeah, it's like a, uh, it's like two blades. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, so that that tool in itself uh, is uh, one one. So you use that tool to cut the peat, and you'll cut uh, uh, enough so you can have a truckload. But also you have to spread the uh, the the uh, with a pitchfork uh, when as soon as my dad is throwing the peat onto the onto the side, I have to straighten it out, uh, like, uh, or I have to straighten it out. It's been a while since I've done it. <laughs> so the, the peat uh, is not like on top of each other, so it can dry. So it's right. on one side, it's drying. And then eventually when it's dry on one side, uh, you turn it ar around and you make little mounds. They're like grog is the term they use uh, in Irish and little mounds so uh, the other side can dry. And you can make small ones. You can start with small ones, bigger ones. And then eventually uh, you come out with a wheelbarrow. And my dad made his own wheelbarrow. He got a, a fantastic, not a traditional wheelbarrow, where he got a, a, a tire um, from a motorbike. Uh, and then he put a wooden frame around it. it was, it's still at home. Uh, I was admiring it last <laughs> time. Yeah, it's still, it still will still work. And you just have to put air in the tire. And, you, I, and I used to do that too. So I did a lot. The only thing I didn't do too much of was cutting the peat. Uh, my dad made it look so easy. Same with cutting hay. Uh, I remember uh, the spal or the site uh, um, they um, uh, they used. He made it look so easy, but it's it's an art uh, to cut hay with the with the site uh, site uh, uh, mic. Uh, you know, it's just this wonderful flow and dance going on. And same with the cut, uh, peating, uh, cutting peat. Um, uh, and everything they did, it was like there was this this wonderful in focus, just in the moment, and and it was a great time too. I, I my dad, I definitely was, good for mental health, almost like a yeah, meditative state. Yeah, and as a teenager, my dad and I used to talk and have a conversation, and we were talking away, and you know, uh, and I look back, and these are fantastic. Uh, even as a teenager, you know, out there, but I was I I, I got proud. And sometimes I have to you know, take uh, the wheelbarrow out to the road, and I'd have to travel maybe three hundred meters or something like that to get the tapete out there. Some people, they got very creative. They used to get like Volkswagens, take the whole Volkswagen apart, put a, uh, like a box in the back and put uh, dual tires on it and get, and they just uh, fill that thing up <laughs> and you'd hear the motor running. It was like, uh, it's our, like they had dumpers. So that was uh, the machinery, you know, later on mm -hmm. they were using machinery to get the beat. Cause it's, you know, you'd have to do a lot of walking. Uh, and That's more like in the, um, the central plains of the country, right? Where they, where they have like machines that harvest it. Yeah, it's that's flat. Right. That's right. Yeah. So, but the traditional cut, uh, p cutting peat is uh, that's a great uh, in my mind. That's a wonderful tradition, and a tradition. And see how what I told you what was going on. It was more than cutting peat. It was a community. Commun right. It was a community when he had the fire, but also my dad and I or my brother if we're working out there talking. And I also got uh, when I started. You know, uh, I felt proud too. Uh, 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 just getting a, a day's work done, and uh, and then uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, some of the other if they brought pea home, uh, you'd have to then put make that uh, into a mound at home as well. So there was a lot of work there. So I helped my dad with that. Uh, you have to do it a specific way so the rain runs down properly to keep the part in the middle part dry um, for you know for the winter time and with. Uh, use that uh, I, I think it's a wonderful tradition and there's more to it than you know cutting peat it, it was like there was a social thing going on right 
and still is because people are still cutting peat. I asked Yeah, people are still cutting peat. So I'm sure the same conversations are still happening out there on the bog. Uh, or, That's or, great. Yeah. It's a silly question, but did each family get assigned a section of the bog or no that's How'd right that they, work yeah it, 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 we just knew we had a bog so <laughs> so yeah it was assigned yeah yeah so it's in the family um i don't know the details uh, about how that because uh, you know with the, this whole uh, climate change and you know uh, and, and trying to get people to stop cutting peat uh, i'm not sure how that's going to work between the government and uh, and the people of those areas that still cut uh, the peat uh, tradition, you know, a traditional way of cutting peat. Um, so, but yeah, it is assigned to uh, to to a family. Yeah. So we and we had other bogs as well. My dad told me so uh, when during when my grandfather used to cut peat, and my, and my grandfather told me he was seeing his mother going out with a donkey or a horse. I think I say a, a horse and cart. Uh, you know, traveling miles and bringing peat home that way. Even planting potatoes too, like far away from the house as well so yeah ever find anything good in the bogs just old uh, pieces of wood um that the were, treasures yeah. or anything. <laughs> no no butter no never saw like they found butter uh yeah. we, we never found anything like that but yeah i'm sure there is and remember ireland was a, an old forest growth a long time ago and that was interesting to find out when i was home in ireland uh, a few years ago pre-covid uh, in spittle um when there was a bad bad hurricane uh the water somehow uh, they saw roots uh, when the water went out uh, they saw the root uh, the um, tree stump, old tree stumps from old forest growth so that's pretty cool so i was thinking about between claire where the burn is where you can see it from right. you know the, you, that was that more likely an old forest grove maybe a long time ago uh, it's, it's hard to believe uh, these things but anyways they found tree stumps there so i thought that was pretty cool Wow, that's, that's that's crazy. Yeah. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. For those of you who don't know exactly how bogs work, I think it's because the the water is acidic, so no bacteria can grow, which is correct. why things that go in there are preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So um, we just know it was going to heat our home, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we were very grateful that the earth provided that to us, and uh, and. Uh, uh, there's gratitude there because uh, you know that connection with the earth. So you take what you need, and uh, the earth provides, and it, and it also actually regenerates too. So that what you take off the top of the bog, you throw it on the other side, and then that's regenerating the bog again right. on the other side. So you just keep doing that. So you're losing a part of the bog, but then you're creating another bog. It's so fascinating. Right. And the more foliage yeah. and stuff that falls into it, just keeps adding layers. Yeah, and there's beautiful lakes around some of the bogs too, and there's fish in them, and uh, we used to do some fishing there too. So, but yeah, it was all it's a lot of fun. Yeah, sounds like it. Okay, now that we've uh, spent a considerable time discussing the bogs, which I personally <laughs> find fascinating, um, how they preserve things and lots mm. of things from long ago have been found in them. Um, let's kind of switch gears and talk about preservation of the Irish language. Um, why is it important? Um, why is it important to promote it and to, to keep it living and not let it die out? Yeah, well, uh, so uh, for me, um, I think with the with the whole pandemic anyways, uh, it, it added a new, uh, for me, uh, teaching the Irish language. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, it came to me that teaching the Irish language is important because uh, uh, people um they want to connect to their ancestors right. or they want to connect to their culture mm -hmm. and that's different for everyone it's different for people who are living in ireland and it's also different for people who live outside of ireland and obviously uh, everyone has a different rel relationship w w with the language um but my relationship with the language is uh, is how i grew up on the girl um as a native speaker um uh I, I am proud to say that uh, my, my family has always spoken Irish. It's, I'm so proud of that now. Where sometimes I remember going into Galway City uh, as a young teenager and felt kind of strange that I was hearing this other foreign language sometimes. Right. And uh, But now as an adult, I am so proud uh, of everything uh, that I experienced uh, 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 
and still do because I, I I still I go back to Ireland. I'll be I'll be uh, you know in Ireland again uh, in a few months. Like um, it, it's it, it's like um, I it, it's important for us to uh, to to learn where we come from. Absolutely. And, uh, and the one and the greatest way to do that, if if a country has a or a, a, a language like we do in Ireland, like the Irish language. And uh, I remember John O'Donoghue saying, he was a wonderful author, he, he wrote Anam Kara, and he was a parish priest also in our community, said that the Irish language is the ghost behind the English language. You, now, in modern terms, you could say it's like the operating system. Because everything <laughs> that we love about the Irish people, I say when we're speaking uh, <laughs> in English, is uh, because of the Irish language. Uh, and, 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 and that's and when you start t learning the Irish language, uh, you'll see that how people talk um, because and that's that's a wonderful. So I uh, it's like fits of food uh, uh, like intertwined. Um, so you can't dismiss the language and we have to embrace it um, and and speak more. Uh, if you can speak it, uh, especially in Ireland, uh, 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 speak it uh, when the opportunity comes. And there's some wonderful, wonderful resources. You know, Radio Nagata, the Irish radio station, TG Car has mm -hmm. wonderful programming promoting the language. And there's lovely Irish speakers uh, that are uh, out there too speaking. Um, there's uh, you can listen to, uh, and like you said in the beginning, there you know people have been recorded, so you have opportunities to listen to beautiful Irish from some of these dialects. Found some on YouTube. I think it was from the University of Cork. It had a they claim it was the oldest um, known recording of, of, of an Irish person speaking Irish. And it, it almost sounded like a song. It just flowed. Yeah. I had no clue what the person was saying at the time. Probably still don't because but, but, it's a different kind of Irish. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Which yeah, we should point old... out there's a number of different dialects if you want to quickly go yeah. through them. Yeah. So, yeah, there's the idioms and there's uh, phrasing that are different to, uh, to the, um, to each dialect, and that's what I try. I, I focus on the Connemara Irish, from where I grew up. But every dialect has something beautiful to offer. And where, and when I was I was down in Kerry uh, last time I was home, I was out uh, in the basket, and uh, we had a, a lovely conversation with one of the caretakers there, a young fella. We went for laughing away. And when he told him, we told him we were from Connemara, we start talking in Irish uh, uh, right away, um, <laughs> and. Um, but he, he would have idioms that would we would not be familiar. Same with Donegal too. Um, uh, so that, and that is uh, those idioms are you know that are being spoken in the community, and right. that's a wonderful thing about dialects. And I, I so uh, that that is, is so some people if they're interested, uh, it's all Irish. Um, uh, the funny thing is, I was learning Munster Irish when I was going to primary school and secondary school. Uh, I really wasn't speaking the living day language I was speaking at home. Um, so it was like I was, you know, reading. So reading is reading, writing, um, more structured. Um, mm -hmm. But I focus on the organic aspect of, you know, spe speaking organically, like uh, how local speakers, native speakers would speak. Right. That kind of, I focus right. on that because that that helps uh, make it more uh, interesting. And like I said before too, you know, um, I'm also very interested in history and I'm interested in the world I live in. And uh, and if you can get up to conversational Irish, then uh, depending you know, on the conversations we have uh, in our lessons, then they can be very interesting and you can communicate. It should be relevant to you as well, what you want to talk about to people. You know, if people ask you questions, if you go back to Connemara, if you want to talk, you know, it's nice to talk. Uh, and it's also <laughs> lovely to talk, uh, if, uh, uh, you know, uh, in another language because you're going to experience, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be a very different experience. It's like some people then, call, some of my students come back, Park, I've had some dreams and uh, uh, I, I was dreaming in, in Irish. <laughs> and, and not one student, but many students uh, that... Uh, it kind of makes sense. Probably there's more Irish, um, you know, you probably have more Irish in your subconscious than you do accessible in your conscious. Well, that's, a, uh, yeah. Mentioning your subconscious, you know, um, like there's a lot that happens in, uh, in that. That's a whole conversation for another time. <laughs> but, uh, it, but you do want to um, uh, 
I structure the lessons where the students are having fun and they're interested and uh, and it was wonderful during the pandemic because some of my students were you know it was a really great outlet for them uh, when every when you know uh, everyone thought, thought the world was falling apart and uh, I tried kept them focused and prior what and prioritize what was important even more now in their lives uh, with the language and focusing on you know uh their identity uh their culture their tradition right. yeah and that's very important uh especially nowadays uh we have to get grounded in our in our in our myths and traditions and uh and stories and, and start telling new stories uh and we need new we, we uh, there's a there's a time now for new storytellers uh, um, and either in the Irish language, or even uh, we need we need um, we need, people are starving for that. And and and, and something that I love about Ireland, it, it's very it can be very inspirational. Yeah. Like uh, yeah, finding out that you know C.S. Lewis was interested in the Irish language a little bit, um, and then Tolkien, uh, Connemara might have inspired uh, you know the Hobbit. Right. So you know, and those are uh, you know Chronicles of Narnia, and those are huge stories uh, for us Westerners. Right. Um, uh, uh, and those, and so we need more stories like that, you know, to help uh, you know humanity. Uh, yeah. uh, and the Irish language is uh, there's some wonderful authors in the Irish language too. Um, uh, I, I, that I that are. Writing, I, I usually love reading um, stories like, for example, Joe Steve Onyacht, and I, I love his storytelling because he's talking about the community and, uh, and the people. And those kinds of stories are very important because uh, you're learning about the people that lived in, uh, lived in, lived in those areas. And uh, we should never forget those people. I have, ne- I, I never forget uh, um, my grandmother, my grandfather. Right, or, absolutely. Or, the, or my neighbors or some of them, you know, or some people that were very important in my life. Um, I make sure that I remember them. I pay um, uh, my respects to them because uh, I wouldn't be here, you know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Everything around you in your environment shapes your life, shapes yeah. who you are and where you came from, where you're going. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I think language is, uh, the Irish language is important. Uh, one, one part of it uh if you want to reclaim the gale inside of you right. <laughs> uh, that is different for everyone um it can be and or if you want to just learn the language uh, uh and just to just to dabble in another language it's 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 a, it's a challenging language in its own way and um but um i can vouch for that <laughs> a lot of people can uh vouch for that but it, it but it's more than that because obviously you want to connect your to where you know Especially people who left Ireland too, you know, um, and God bless the people that stayed in Ireland too. Oh yeah, you know, and what they went through, you know, and the, you know. Uh, so I have respect for the people who uh, stayed in Ireland, who left Ireland, you know, and uh, uh, so um, yeah, it's it's the language is also changing too. So there's a lot of new words too that sometimes are difficult to pronounce because they're describing uh, you know technology or right. you know they, they don't sound uh, the same as you know uh, some of the older words that have been with us for a long time yeah but very, it's, irish it's, is a very old language it is very old and it's transitioning very well too so yeah so it's a great language where some of the uh, you know languages like even here in canada are linguistically you know struggling but the irish language is uh, not struggling which um, is great i mean mm-hmm. I feel like it wasn't too long ago where it was, you know, talking about being extinct one day. Yeah, th- people, they can say it's extinct. Um, um, but I'm working very, I work hard with people in Ireland too that are embracing the language and and um, helping them to fall in love with the language. So, and, they, and, they're, uh, and if they have an opportunity to speak, they're going to speak it. So um, that's the thing. It's not like I'm teaching students uh, outside of Ireland. I'm teaching students within Ireland as well. So, right. and I'm showing them like um, uh, how I grew up with the language, and right. yeah, and that's a, that's very it's very different from what, what you learn in a book. Right. Um, yeah, and those so, people. 
some of those people are still uh, alive too, like my father, for example, who's mm-hmm. you know uh, you know a generation now. He's in his seventies, so he's got lovely wisdom as well, and is a wonderful storyteller teller too. Yeah. yeah, it usually is that way. You know, I always regret sometimes not tapping into the knowledge of of, our, of their elders. I mean, I think now there's so many things I would have wanted to ask my grandmother that I just never thought of, or I was too young to think of before she passed, and uh, it's yeah. a shame. Um, just want to take I, feel one sa- st- I feel the same way too, uh, Mike. Just taking one step back, just because I want to give people a better idea of the Irish language, and we talked about mm-hmm. living languages and dead languages and whatnot. And please correct me if I have any of this wrong, Park. Yeah. Um, the framework is this Celtic languages, and still in existence now. There are six, I believe, mm-hmm. and it divided into two branches. So with, with Irish, it's on one of those branches. Um, with the other um, Gaelic languages, so to speak, you have Irish um, Gaelic, Scots Gaelic, and Manx, which is from the Isle of Man. That's the one grouping. And then the other grouping, you have um, Welsh, Cornish, um, Breton, which is spoken in the uh, northwest of France. Um, so that's kind of where, where the languages come from. And early we discussed dialects of Irish and there's what Munster from the south, this Connemara Irish from where you are. Mm-hmm. There's what Ulster in the yeah. north, and does Upper Donegal Dundagall. have its own? And Donegal has its yeah. own. Yeah, Guiador, uh, yeah, and they have their own dialect. And then there's a lot of Irish spoken in um, uh, Northern Ireland too, like up in Belfast now these days, and other parts of Northern Ireland. So um, yeah, we never really touched base on what's going on off in Northern Ireland too. Like there's a huge renaissance going on in the, in the north as well with the language. Um, so that's wonderful to see. Yeah, Ireland's comparatively it's a very small island. Why would there be yeah. so many dialects of the same language? Um, you know, and, and the reality is, you know, people were very cut off from each other long times ago. So. People may have stopped traveling or whatever the case may be, and they kind of develop their own idiosyncrasies. Um, and one other thing I should point out, too, is we forgot one dialect. Was it the official dialect? That yeah. Supposedly well, taught in schools now. Yeah, like the Munster uh, Irish. Yeah. Uh, they use that for the official, uh, uh, especially from the state, if you're, if you're right. corresponding with the state or uh, in the schools. Yeah. So my advice to anybody who decides they want to learn Irish, um, pick a dialect and stick with it. <laughs> it's, it's less confusing that way. You can always pick up from other dialects later on the, this, the differences. But if you try to learn a mishmash, you'll just end up going in circles. Mm-hmm. Um, and as Park mentioned, he teaches Connemara Irish, which I happen to like personally. So mm-hmm. it works out well. But, you know, just to be aware of the different dialects that exist. Yeah. And... Uh... Yeah, so I'm not a, uh, like, um, I've worked with linguists uh, and uh, we've talked about the Irish language. Um, so my teaching approach is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very or, uh, like the organic approach to, to conversation, having a conversation, um, not so heavily focused on the grammar, but grammar is important. But the conversational part is, um, they all agree that's a really great way to teach a language uh so i've like uh, 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 uh so i'm not a linguist but worked with linguists i intuitively knew this anyways uh, and then it was conf- and it was right. confirmed by working with linguists who also were interested in learning the irish language now when it comes to now that's a great question dialects yeah uh, obviously the people in the community they they talk you know depending on what they're talking about um don't forget the islands as well because there's irish being spoken on some of the islands too like even uh, the iron islands uh, just off mm-hmm. where i grew up uh uh, they have their own dialect. Uh, no, no, it's more. It's it's uh, no, it's not. Uh, they might have different idioms, maybe. That's still Connemara. It's, yeah, but I wouldn't even want to say Connemara because it's uh, it's out in the it's uh, in the uh, Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's it's uh, you have to remember there was a lot uh, before uh, what happened in Ireland. It was all Irish in Ireland, right. and, and Barry Cunliffe, you know that statement he makes, uh, you know. He, some people might agree with him. Some people might not, would maybe disagree with him. But to say that Irish or that form of Gaelic was already spoken uh, before the Celts came, th- that fascinates me, uh, the, uh, how he comes to that conclusion. 
um, because you know th there's a lot of history uh, uh, happening. You know, especially going back to Neolithic times, like right. on the western coastline. Like even uh, you know, you go all the way down to, you know, Dingle, Cork, but you also go up to Clare, up to the Iron Islands, up to right. you know Galway, up to Sligo. It's very very interesting. Um, so there's a lot. There's a lot still needs to be written about Ireland, uh, um, about its past, and it's important. And we, we, we're, we're all trying to figure it out. Uh, we just need someone to tell us the truth <laughs> about it. Well, that, that's yeah. true in a lot of ways. And I had an yeah. interesting comment on one of my previous YouTube videos where the person made the point that a lot of the people in academia, they've kind of like they're in their own echo chamber. They've decided mm. what it is. And that's what it is, and I don't want to hear anything else. And it's very difficult for someone to come with something new and stand up against them. And, yeah. and I never really thought of that, you know. And it's probably true. Oh yes, yeah, definitely true. Um, so we just uh, we have to kind of, you know, from living in the Gaeltacht, uh, you know, being blessed to be around the people. Uh, they are a reminiscence of uh, of the people that were, you know maybe go back, you know, a long time. Um, even this, uh, the, the, our sailing boats uh, that we have, like the Pukons and the Glotugs, like that, that, kind of, that, that kind of sailing is unique to that part of the, the, the world too. And, and uh, I find that very interesting too. Um, and I'm blessed to know uh, my uncle, um, uh, he has a boat, um, and he loves. He loves. He also, he loves working on the, uh, like sailing and working on the boat. And when I was home, he was showing us. He was working on a, a another boat, and uh, but there's, that's an art in itself too. Oh yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, there's so many traditions, and uh, like just like we could be the all boat day did you say here. That was? Uh, uh, the Pukon uh, is one. Um, Are those two, the boats uh, that you see out, um, like in, in, in the water by Roundstone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pukon and then there's Glowtogs as well. There's two, you know, they're like uh, two different boats. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, they're they're usually red sailing boats, and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, not easy to sail uh, the coastline, you know, without GPS. You know, I remember going being out on a boat and. They know the the sea, uh, like the coastline, you know, right. the areas that are rocky and to stay away from, and also know where to fish as well. So very self sufficient. And those same boats also used to bring peat out to uh, to the islands. Um, and the people who lived on those islands were uh, yeah, from just visiting the Blasticate Island, and you know it wasn't easy. But uh, for but for Inishmore, Inishmore, and Inishir, you know, yeah, uh, three the uh, three islands um, able to. There's people still speaking Irish out there, and um, and still have uh, you know uh, they live out there. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a different uh, different uh, kind of person that can live in it's those environments. <laughs> yeah, it is a subculture. Yeah, an island living is very different. Saying that Ireland is an island too, but we have to remember, you know, Ireland was also connected to mainland Europe a long, long time ago when we. Yep. Yeah. So we don't know what happened. You know. Uh, uh, you know what's happening on that land. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we need to do some more, you know, uh, research uh, about about our about uh, where we come from. Um, yeah. And so, like I said to you, every time I go back to Ireland, I always learn something new about myself. Uh, I visited a place called Ushnach, uh, uh when I while I was there, and. I, I also learned something new again uh, about uh, about Ireland. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, all so to connect everything we talked about in the last uh, hour now, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, it's uh, yeah. Just con uh, try and connect with uh, where you come from. Learn, learn about the culture. Learn about the tradition. I gave you one example of uh, going to the bog. But right. it was more than couldn't Pete. It was a social. It was more of a social thing, you know. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it felt like it, when uh, uh, it does feel like a kind of a church out there. You don't hear any. Very, there was you never hear any airplanes going by. It was extremely quiet, you know, and so it's a great place to be. Um, so yeah, so that's only one. 
tradition, but many traditions, you know. And we didn't even got talking about the fairy folks, Mike. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so that's a conversation maybe for another time, uh, maybe. Sure, that's definitely an interesting topic. <laughs> okay, well, um, I want to thank Park for spending all his time with us and discussing uh, the Great Ireland and the Irish language, and you know what things are out there in Ireland that have been discovered and not discovered. Um, before I go, though, I want to give um, Park the opportunity to discuss his uh, Irish language uh, teaching service real quick. Yeah, so, yeah, people just uh, visit my website. Uh, it's parkdanu.com. Um, 50 minutes trial. We connect, find out where you're at. Uh, if you have any questions about the lessons, about me, you can tell me why you want to learn the Irish language. Um, and then... Uh, uh, usually the lessons are designed around 10 lessons and it helps. Um, um, I feel 10 lessons is a great place to, uh, it's a commitment. Uh, and if you're serious about learning language, because I take it pretty seriously. Um, and I think 10 lessons and sometimes will you know, if you decide to, uh, you know, sign on for more, that, that's great. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's once, once a week, sometimes twice a week, uh, but also depending on people's schedule. And it's a great way to, um, you know, language learning is, uh, is, it doesn't matter what language you're learning. It's really, really good um, a way to, uh, especially with the Irish language, it's also learning about uh, the Gaelic that there is and uh, how important, why the Irish language is so important for the, uh, for the, for the Gaelic people. And the Irish people and people are their families left are extremely important, especially nowadays. And um, yeah, and 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 so far, excuse me, I've been uh, very successful. And I'll uh, and and maybe later on I'll be doing different things. But so far, uh, but at the moment I'm teaching the language and I have wonderful students from all over the world, great people, and uh, like yourself, Mike and. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a wonderful journey uh, that, uh, and I want to share more about where I come from um, because there's uh, lots of nuggets of wisdom uh, in Connemara and in um, uh, in all the rural areas of uh, uh, in Ireland. Each every community has something to offer the people. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, just uh, you know get yourself. Uh, uh, you know, interested uh, in learning a language, um, and, uh, and that will open up uh, a new universe for you. <laughs> and, yeah, and just to point out to everybody too, you know, there's, there's many ways to learn languages, and the ways they teach ooh. in school probably aren't the best. So don't just think, oh, I have to trudge through yeah. a language and writing the same word or sentence fifty times or whatever. Yeah, no, it doesn't have to be that way. Park has a lot of experience doing it a different way. There's lots of methods out there. So don't let what you might have done in, in, in school turn you off um, to anything. I can personally vouch for Park's lessons. I signed up for a 10 lesson block and here I am three and a half years later uh, yeah. still learning. So, yeah. And uh, I know something it, to consider. it is. And uh, you've had an extremely busy, busy schedule. You have a family and, uh, you know, you've. Uh, so every you know just 45 you know finding 45 minutes uh, you know from your busy schedule uh, it's uh, sometimes it's hard for people but you know and it's not very and if you look at time wise it's not very very long you know um cuz remember i i had uh, uh, over 20 years <laughs> every day uh, uh, and no english really except you know a little bit of english um, i'd hear here and there but yeah it was always irish so um amazing yeah so, yeah and so i you know i try try to um uh, emulate you know an immersion but at the end of the day the real immersion happens if you uh, have time to go to to Connemara or, or any of these bail uh, or even spend you know uh you know six months or even live in these areas uh, yeah you would be able to absorb the, but some but uh, I have uh, done my own research and people have said that, you know, yeah, even moving, um, they still need it to have a, a kind of a grounding or foundation. I've also taught people in the Gelfa too. So that's mm -hmm. funny, you know, so people <laughs> living in the Gelfa areas that have moved or, you know, to the areas. So, um, um, so it's like, uh, there's no right or wrong way um, here. It's just having fun with it 
and just be open-minded and see where it takes you. It might not be, the language might open other opportunities for you. So, you know, it could be maybe even to writing or maybe, uh, you know, you want to read, you know, you're interested in reading, um, you know, uh, it, could, it could be other creative, you don't know what, you might start with the Irish language, but it could actually open other doors for you creatively as well. Um, so um, it's just trying to, uh, 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 first of all, get people be, uh, to know that, yeah, Irish language is extremely important for us people. Uh, and uh, I want to hear uh, more Irish being spoken in Ireland. And I'm very... That'll pleased. be great. Yeah, and, and it's happening. I see it in Northern Ireland and, and people are just wanting to speak more Irish now. So it's great. And I think it, this, these are good times uh, for, for, the, for, for, the, for the country. And I, I'm hoping to be part of that, uh, you know, to play a role in that too. And uh, I've even taught people that became Irish, um, or not taught, but uh, I've conversed with people who are also on a journey with the Irish language and then came Irish language officers themselves because they, and also lived overseas and then, uh, be, you know, um, are now caretaking for the language in their communities. So it's wonderful. So, yeah. yeah, and there's lots of resources there. So there's no excuse. I'm only one, uh, you know, there's many resources, but I'm just, I'm one, uh, I'm focusing from the native speaker's point of view. And I'm here if uh, people are interested. Um, and uh, yeah, and I uh, look forward to working with you. I'd like to thank Park for uh, joining us today um, and we had a great conversation. Um, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, oh, been great. Thank you very much. Uh, Slan, goodbye. Yeah. Thanks, Mike.